Good evening, and welcome to the Nobody Asked Me Guy Show. Guys, I'm your host, Melvin Casey Lars, and this evening, as always, we have a dynamic guest with us. Guys, and I'm glad to say he is my friend. I've known this young man for so many years. I don't know if you want me to tell his age, so I'll let him tell that. But I've known him for so many, many years, and uh, he's, he's just a phenomenal man. He's done so many great things. That's the person of Elder Willie Blackwell. And he's done so many great things uh, throughout his life. And uh, like, like all of us, we've had challenges. And I know that you guys saw in the heading, uh, he's a, a kidney transplant a patient. And uh, there have been other challenges prior to that. So we will definitely, guys, get into all of that tonight. And we want you to feel free to come on. If you have any questions uh, for Elder Blackwell about any particular that all of our guests uh, that are here, feel free to join in as well. So without further ado, because you didn't come to hear me babble, you came to talk to Elder Willie Blackwell. Elder Blackwell, how are you this evening, sir? How you doing, brother? How you doing, my sir? Listen, brother, I cannot complain. I'm just happy that you're here. I'm happy your guests are here. And I'm happy to be here. Now, Elder Blackwell, you and I have to go way, yes, sir. way back. You know, and, and I was talking to you earlier, and I was sharing with you that sometimes people don't really get to know the journey. They don't really get to know the person. You know, they just kind yeah. of find things that are on the back end. Will, will you share with us just a little bit and, and kind of walk us in, into this in, into this uh, presentation that, that we are getting ready to start? Well, happy, man. First of all, thank you for having me on your show, man. It's good to see you. You're looking good. You're looking, you're, I, look, I like your beard there on each side. You got your stuff going thank on. You, you look good, man. Yeah, Melvin, uh, you know, we go all the way back to uh, Bossier and Shreveport, Louisiana. My dad was in the military, uh, Melvin. Uh, he uh, Actually, we grew up in St. Louis, and he was in the Vietnam War over there. And when he came back from Vietnam, he said that uh, you guys are going to be going to Louisiana now. And I said, okay, Dad, where are we going? He said, uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. I said, where is that? He said, don't worry about where it is. That's where you're going. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> military dad. <laughs> and I had, you know, my five brothers and three sisters, you know, off the car we went. And so we came over to uh, Shreveport and uh, uh, was living over there on that side of the place. And he got some kind of, uh, uh, I guess he was a, he was a firefighter in, in the United States Air Force. And they said he had to move over to another location. So we had enrolled in, in Captain Street High School for about uh, two weeks. And then we had to get out of Captain Street High School and go on the other side to Bossier City, Louisiana, which I didn't know what that was, and, and a school called Airline High School. And we enrolled in there. And so I said, OK, well, this is where we're going to be. So you know, during that time, they had just finished the, the segregation and stuff. So. I, you know, I had I was telling my, my wife about it. I said we had left uh, St. Louis, Missouri, where it was black on black crime, and then we come down here to Atlanta, where white on white on black crime. I said I went from one extreme to the other extreme. So how are we gonna okay. survive this? So you know, and my dad was telling me how the things he did and to survive and all that, and he told you know he gave us the full support. And then he said, well, you need to go out there and play some football. I said I don't know how to play. This. I, I just didn't know how to play, Melvin. I, I didn't know. Right. You know, I said, well, uh, maybe they will build some camaraderie, get to meet some people, uh, you know, students and stuff, uh, uh, particularly during the, the black and white integration period. And that's why I got to meet you guys and all the rest of the people. And uh, you remember that when I came on the field, I had my show ads on backwards, people were laughing right. at me and, and they were humiliating me. And I, man, I felt just as low. As you can feel, and I and uh, and you know, it's a but that boy came out here playing football, and he got a dog on shoulder pads on backward. What is wrong with it? And, and, and <laughs> allow me to apologize nationally for being one of those knuckleheads. <laughs> and, and so, so please you continue. Know, so, you know, and but I said, you know, hey, this is what it is. Uh, if my dad can go to Vietnam and survive and come back, I can get through that. So to make a long story short, I did get through it, made the team. As you know, our good friend, you yourself, and you know the late Gary Big Hand Johnson, you know, with Grambling and and some and other guys. You know, I saw what you guys were doing, and I said, you know, I can do this. I can make this a career. Uh, and uh, there was another people that uh, Coach Riley Stewart, who's gone on to pass on. He was assistant principal at Bolger City, and he was very instrumental. 
uh, after we had a good season at airline, things were going well, and, and uh, it was going pretty good. Uh, but uh, I remember, you know, airline high school, you know, like that time, you know, it was it was going through a desegregation period. You know, it was it was good, but I saw what was going on. I said, I got to be able to graduate uh, I, I, so I can go to college <laughs> and try to and get a better life for myself. And I, I remember some, you know, there were some good days at airline. And it was some bad days. What I mean by that, you know, it's just, it just how it was. So I said, okay, I'm just going to stay positive and do what I need to do. And so make a long story short, as you know, we had a great season. You know, we went down to the state championship. We won a lot of games. I played all state, all district, and all that. And Riley Stewart said, look, I know LSU won't sign you. He said, but I want you to go to Atlanta. I said, yeah, man, Atlanta's hot, and He said, yeah. He said, I want you to go to uh, Morris Brown. I said, what in the world is that? I knew about Morehouse College. I didn't know about no Morris Brown. And he said, look, you go there, you're some stepson, and, you know, and, and, and come on back. If you don't like it, you can go to LSU. Uh, he said, pr- pr- he said, he said, now I'm going to be honest with you. I think I like about Riley Stewart. He was very honest during that time. You got to understand this is the time period we're talking about, you know, 19, what, 73? And he said, look, LSU is a good school. It's going to be a great school. He said, but I don't think right now with this the segregation that it'll be good for you to go there. I don't think you'll get the quality education that you get now. I'm not saying it won't be in the future, but right now. So go and take a look at it. He gave me some, hey, man, Melvin, he gave me some wonderful advice. I went to uh, Atlanta. Uh, uh, folks took me out on the town. Uh, and then I, I said, this is wonderful. And then they said, look, I want you to go to one more school. And it's called Spelman College. I said, what is that? He said, you'll see. Melvin, I went over there and I saw these African-American ladies with green eyes. And I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from uh, New Orleans. Where the down? Okay. I said, she said, you come here, you see us all the time. Man, that was it. And uh, of course, my wife's from Spelman too. I don't know if you knew that. She graduated from Spelman. So I went back and, and got involved with Morris Brown and, uh, had a good career at Morris Brown. Uh, things are going real well for me. Uh, uh, played in the All-Star game and went out to California. And, you know, uh, Mario Kasim, he was one of the coaches in in, uh, in the SWAC. And when they had the Black All-America, was out there with a bowl game. And, Melvin, I was sitting there. And and, and this, this is how God works. He'd give you. He put people in your life to help you, man. I was sitting there looking, and all of a sudden, here comes a, 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 a mirage of people, and it got closer and closer. And I said, "Man, that's Muhammad Ali," and he had a he had a, a mirage of people, and he was coming across the field, and he came and he came straight out of all them people, cameras out there and TV. He come up to me, "You can't play no football, you little bit chump. Don't you know you ain't nothing? Don't you know you ain't?" And and and, and this moment a second. He got into my head just that quick. And then he said, you see how I got into your head, young man? You see how I took you out to be? You can't let people do that. You know who you are. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here. And man, it gave me such a valuable lesson. It kind of reminded me back with the with the shoulder pad thing back, you know, when people was getting on. And he gave me such a valuable lesson that I said, man, look at this, man. And I told my wife, the only thing I re- didn't realize, I should have got I should have gotten one of them autographs. Uh, gloves for him. So I took that approach with that approach and I went on and I said, okay, this is going to work. Had an opportunity, went back to Morris Brown in 77. And when I graduated, you know, Marvin, that was a great feeling when the president of the company get up and ask you to stand up in front of all the people in college and said, Willie Blackwell has been an outstanding student. You know, he was the, the president of Congress Mill of Affairs. He volunteered in this and he signed a two year NFL contract to the Washington Redskins. And then I had just got my bonus check, Melvin. And I had went downtown, bought me a 1977 Chrysler Cordova. Hey, man, I came back on the campus. I thought I was it, man. I said, this is it. <laughs> and uh, it went well. And then, what you know, only thing that, that I was telling my wife is that a lot of my, you know, when you're playing in the NFL, I was a free agent because they didn't draft me. My buddy, Ezra Johnson, who's also from Louisiana, uh, went to uh, Green Oaks. He was a number one draft pick in '77 with Green Bay, and I went to the to the Redskins. And uh, I said, "Man, I don't care. 
when I got up there with George Allen, and George Allen saw me play, he said, man, he said, you you serious, ain't you? He said, well, you, you know, you you going to be okay. So I knew I was going to be all right. But one thing I didn't realize, and everybody have told me, that, he said, you know, injuries are a part of this game. And I heard that, Melvin, but I didn't hear it. Being a free agent, you know what I'm saying? I heard it, but I didn't hear it, you know, because I – I know I exactly was, what you mean. I, I said, okay, all right, so – I'm doing really well, and then, you know, I got hurt. And then, you know, George, uh, I got, you know, I made enough money that year. Then uh, next year, you know, uh, uh, Chuck Knox up in Buffalo called me. I went up there and told him muscles up again. And Chuck Knox said, "Boy, he's a hell of a player." <laughs> you know, golly, I got good, I got good, got well. I had, I had enough money to get me through that through that year. And then I said, "Well, I'll go up there again." I went to Kansas City, and uh, man. Lo and behold, I was taking them um, volumes of snatched and tore all them hamstring muscles up again. I said, Lord Jesus. <laughs> you know. But I was on a team in December, so I was on the on, on, on a team and I had money. I was doing well living up there. And so it was just one of those things where you say, okay. And then I saw a guy in camp broke his got his neck got broke. And he didn't agree really publicize this. I saw in college, I thought about it. I said, the guy in my college, he died. And then I said, after that, I went up to the Canadian League. I said, you know, I have been, I been doing, I done this about three three years. And I said, I'm able to walk. I'm able to talk. You know, I got money. I made pretty good money. I didn't make the kind of money that I would have made, but I had money to, you know, for that time to put on. So I wouldn't, I wasn't hurting. I said, I got my, I got my, I got my, I be in, in physical education and hotel restaurant management. So I had four years. Uh, three and a half years of NFL and a half year up in Canadian League bouncing around. I said, you know, I need to, I need to settle down, man, and, and go to work and try to and just do some other things. But and so I, I met uh, my wife Kathy. Like I said, she was she was an old Spellman. We've been married now for thirty four years. Had three kids and four grandkids, and um, I got four years. In, Congratulations. Excuse me, forty two. I said, can throw a shoe at me. Yeah. I, I bet she will. Congratulations. Yeah, she, <laughs> I'm, yeah man. So we've been married, and uh, Melvin, I'm going to tell you, man, I uh, I was able to use my food service degree to go to work for this company called, uh, it was it used to be Dobbs International Service, the largest airline caterer in the United States. They later changed the name to Gay Gourmet, and I became an account executive. And I worked my work up 10 years. And um, I noticed that uh, my wife was a flight attendant, Delta, and she's a tough-nosed girl. You know, she handled everything. So when the planes would come up, when to the plane, we're back up to the to, to the to the uh, trucks. If you miss one item, they never got paid. And a lot of times, it was people that couldn't speak English, they couldn't read, whatever, and so the company was losing a lot of money. And Dobbs at that time, which was called, but now called Gay Gourmet, they was in the post in the side of losing their money. So I had to the, the, uh, to the uh, local general manager. I said, look, man, I'm a volunteer at, at my church. And we do on-site uh, literacy training for, uh, for people. I said, why don't we bring this thing in-house? It, it'll never happen. He said, the union is not going to let you do it. Uh, uh, the people are not going to do it. They're going to feel shame. I said, wait a minute. I said, first of all, why don't we ask Delta Airlines because you're about to lose the account anyway. Okay. And then why don't we get the union people and ask them about it. Man, the uh, Delta Airlines representative came in there and the president of the company came in there. He said, man, we ain't ever heard nothing like this. Let's do it. If the people come, let's do it. He said, you think the people come? I said, look, I'm just going to ask the people this. If you had an opportunity to go back to school to get your GED and you didn't get it, and you want to improve your reading and writing school and the company's willing to pay for it, all you got to do is volunteer your time, would you do it? They said yes. We did a pilot program in Atlanta uh, where we also had an on-site graduation for a year. We invited, uh, we had 12 people. They all graduated, they brought all their families. And their children, they had graduation music, put a ball caps and gown. Uh, CNN came out, did a big story on it. It went nationwide, and it was, it was a big success. 
And then they said, well, look, you're not going to be, you're going to not get a, a promotion. You're going to be a corporate executive for the next five years. We want you to go out to the United States and do this all over the country. And uh, I was just, wow. I was, I was excited, man. I, I said, God, you didn't open up something for me to do this helping people. And the company was doing it because they, they were they really wanted to help people, but they also wanted to help themselves, you know, because it was, <laughs> I'm going to be for real, it was an opportunity to help improve people's skills, writing skills. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of them. We had over 8,000 people. And, uh, and, that, and, that, and today, from that 8,000 people, I still today get texts from those people thanking me. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have got this promotion. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't be, have a pension because what you did, nobody else did. And I'm, you know, I'm able to take care of my family and retire because of what you did. And so I thank God for that opportunity. And so what happened from that? Brother that Blackwell, was, <clears throat> as, mm -hmm. as you share that, it, it just goes to prove, man, you are a true humanitarian. You concerned about other people. You wanted to see their lives improved. And you didn't just talk about it. You, all of us have heard the old saying, don't just talk about it, be about it. So you didn't just talk about it. You were being about it, brother. Bravo. Please continue. Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, you know, I, I, I was, you know, God, but God, I, you know, when I was going through that path, you know, I said, God, I know you want me to do this, but you had to, I didn't know how to do it. So I had to pray, God, how do I go about doing it? You know, he said, we well, just ask the people. Okay. Okay. How, what kind of teachers am I going to get? Pray to me. I'll send you the right administrators. Okay. How are we going to get the companies going to say they'll fund it? But you know how these companies are. At some point, they don't want to keep funding it. And then the Holy Spirit said, there's money available for it. <laughs> so it, it all goes back to God. You know, yes. he just yes. uses you and you just go ahead and be a willing vessel. And, and he'll direct your paths. And that's what I did. And people said, well, God, you're, you're brilliant, you're smart. I said, no, I prayed. I got a little common sense, but that Holy Spirit says it's the best kind of sense you can have. And so to make a long story short, that program, like I said, I went and wrote a book called America, Yes, I Can Read, because I wanted other corporations and other companies to benefit from it too. Because one of the the guys from CNN, he said, well, look, man, if you... If you get all these people educated and, and you get them expiring and they leave the company, that's gonna hurt y'all. I said, no, it's not gonna hurt us. It's gonna help the community and other the communities where, the, where we do business. It's gonna help the other communities we go. So it's a win-win for everybody. It's absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a different and it's a paradigm change in the way you think. And so from that from that sense. Uh, they asked me to, to give up my baby, and I didn't want to give it up. Uh, but, but they said, look, man, we got this Amtrak account. It's about $62 million. <laughs> boy, I tell you. And uh, what you'll be doing is you'll be responsible for all the food service on Amtrak in the whole United States. Okay, you'll be responsible for about 300 employees and 12 general managers nationwide. And I said, I guess I need to give up my baby then, don't I? <laughs> and so... <laughs> Uh, uh, and then this happened. I had I was having a problem with my left kidney, and I kept getting a, a pain in it. And I went to the doctor, and uh, this guy that, that looked at it, his name is Dr. Robert Happel. He's a chief radiologist at Piedmont. He's now retired. I had met him, Melvin. Uh, I had met him about three years prior. He was getting a divorce on a jury trial where he had met this young lady, and she had put him through school, and he decided he wanted to just leave her and meet somebody else. And I was the foreman on that jury trial and was able to get through that trial and get, make sure that we got alimony payment and child support payment set up for those kids. And he came to me and asked me, he said, well, look, I appreciate your help. I said, sir, I didn't help you. I was looking out for those children and that young lady because you know you was wrong. He said, well, look, if you ever need my help, come to Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta. Four years later, guess who I see? Dr. Robert Howe. Wow. He found, he found uh, on my left kidney um, a small cancer developed. And he said, if I had waited another month, it would have been too late. And he said, the reason he got to remove the whole kidney because where's that? 
And uh, he found that and I was able to remove that kidney. And they told me, they said, look now, after we remove this kidney, about, you know, we think about 10 years from now, 15 years from now, whatever, at least 15, 20, you're gonna need a kidney at some point. So that made a decision right there, changed my diet. Uh, I got off all red meat, pork. I went on fruits and vegetables, exercise. I, I did that 20 years ago. And uh, and lo and behold, then of course this came to happen after I retired from Gay Mate, went to work for uh, CarMax and uh, started helping them doing some things. As you know, CarMax is now number one in the United States. And I them what I did with Gay Mate. And they asked me to come to their corporate office and I went to their corporate office and did some things with the computers. And now when you buy a car from CarMax, you just pick up a phone, you just tell them what you want, they have it delivered to you, you know, <laughs> and all kind of stuff. And and I just retired from there on uh, Monday. And uh, remember what I was sharing with you before we came on the air, I said, okay, I thought I was going into a building where maybe a couple of people and we'll have a piece of cake and this and that. They shut the whole building down. That's yeah. the kind of, and that's the kind of man you are. Yeah, that's, the kind of respect, that's the kind of respect yeah. people have for you. I said, Melvin, y'all gonna make, Melvin had me cry. I said, y'all gonna make me cry. And I said, well, Mr. Well, we appreciate you what you've done. And I said, well, okay, God, I appreciate that. And they said, Mr. Willie, you know, when you was working here and you had that kidney Proud. We ain't never seen a person come to work with that much pain that you had and the work you did and the and advice you gave us. And not only that you was helping yourself, you helped two other people while you was needing a kidney find kidneys. You took the time to help two other people find a kidney. Mm -hmm. We seen mm -hmm. you on TV. We seen you on NBC. Now you and all this pain, we seen you. And we had to do something for you. And uh, the other gentlemen, they got their kidneys, their families happening. So I said to myself, you know, God, um, he's a wonder, man. I mean, Melvin, it is what it is, man. I, I just thank him every day. I tell people every day, my goal in life now is to be, is try to help people. And I, I was telling the guy today, the guy, uh, Gregory, he just told me that he's getting his kidney and a liver. And uh, I told him that he would get it. He said, yeah, you told me. I said, I told you, but you didn't believe. I said, you got to believe it. You're going to get it, man. And you're going to get it. He's getting his kidney. I said, it just takes faith. Wow. You just got to believe it. And it'll happen. And so and my God, God also. Now, <laughs> yes. And so and God I'm, is trying also. To, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to promote, uh, you know, kidney awareness. You know, there's four type, types of kidney disease. Uh, type one, type three, type four. A lot of people got two and three. They don't even know they got it. Uh, uh, people that keep, keep their blood pressure checked, you know, diabetic affects particularly African American community and Spanish community. And we're sitting here today. By the end of the day, we know, according to the National Kidney Foundation, Melvin, that between twelve and fifteen people will be dead because they didn't get a transplant. They just didn't make it. And this happens every day in America. You got over a hundred thousand people on dialysis waiting for a kidney transplant. And so my goal, if I could just uh, be an encouragement to them, uh, to let them know that, hey, look, you got to change your diet, okay? Uh, you got to be around positive people. Uh, you got to keep your faith in God. And you can get a, you can get a kidney. There are a lot of people in the world, although the world is what it is, that this last guy that got his kidney, he got it because all of the publicity that we kept putting out there and putting out there, and people said, look, let me help this person. You know, the guy that gave me my kidney, you know, they saw my stuff on the news. They saw it on Instagram. They, they Googled Willie Blackwell needs a kidney. They saw me. They said, this guy is, you know, hey, something happened to me. I wanted to have my kidney. And that's what he told the family. And I had to write a wow. letter to the family. I wrote a letter to the family and told them to thank you for doing that. And that's what happened. So I'm out here to promote uh, uh, good health. And most of all, just be kind to people, man. <laughs> just That's be a kind mouthful. Of That's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. And sadly, Elder Blackwell, that's what happens too many times is that we just, for some reason, we I'm talking about the universal we. Yeah. We think that destruction and hatred and war is the way to go, even in the name of God. 
Yes, you yeah. Know, even in the, the name religious. of God, man. And 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 so I hear you very loud. But listen, allow me, please, and I don't want to keep you all sure. night. No Let's circle back a little bit. Yeah. You've been very forthcoming. And and I know my audience is going they love it because I see the thumbs going up and the hearts going up and things like that. You have already shared with us. You had five, there were eight of you guys. Your father mm -hmm. being in the military. We all know the story of being, first of all, being as we accept being African-American or Black or whatever. When one, even if there's only two or three kids in the family, uh, progress, is that what say, well, you know, somebody, somebody, well, you know, well, well, he was the lucky one. But now from the knowledge that I have of you and your siblings, mm -hmm. your siblings have, have gone on to do uh, yep. great things as well professionally mm -hmm. and i would like for you to share with our audience because i know how close you and your dad were and your dad's going to sleep now i know yeah. your mom was a beautiful lady very sweet yes. kind i i i because I, I, I have a lot of young people here elder blackwell mm. will, will, will you share with our audience the importance of understanding uh the the camaraderie that has to be within a family regardless of the difficulty uh, understanding and obeying the parents. Can you share a little bit of that, please? Yeah, that's good, man. I mean, that's a good saying. You know, you know, the Bible said, "Honor thy mother and thy and father, so your days will be long." <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, I had a lot of. You know, my dad. You know, he was a military. He was hard, man. And I couldn't figure out, you know, why he's so hard. And then I just stopped and thinking. He said, "Well, you know, uh, I want you to be something." So when your dad tell you he wants you to be something someday, and your mom do too, you know, I start kind of listening, you know. And then because, see, you know, I didn't go to college. You know, I went to the military. He said, my dad died at a young age, you know. When I was 17, 18 years old, I had to go in the military because he died. I had to go take care of my mom. And so when he told me all this thing, when he began to share with me, and then I said, okay, now I got to be the first to go to college. And then I told my brothers, I said, y'all got to be next. And they're like, you know, Elmer, he went to college. You know, he went to uh, uh, college. And then uh, my brother Floyd, he didn't want to go to college, but he went to, he went to high school. And he went and drive them trains. And I said, well, shoot, Floyd making more money than we did. He driving trains. He didn't even go to college. You know, <laughs> you know? and all my sisters doing at, at, at great careers. You know, my brother went to work in a UPS. I mean, he made good money. I mean, they're doing well. And yeah. so, and, and we had differences of brothers and siblings growing up. It's kind of like I was telling the people yesterday at the uh, at the Carmax graduate at the Carmax re retirement party. And they always, I always get this call. So, how was it playing football in the, in the NFL? What do you really miss? I said the relationships that I still have today. I still have relationship. I said, I just went to an NFL retreat uh, uh, last year, and I saw guys that I was dealing with for the last 15, 20 years I hadn't seen in years. I said, when I left Gay Cormay, the relationship that I built up with over 20,000 people, I said, the relationship that I built up with you guys here, it's like family. And the families, and I told them at, at the event, you argue, you have differences, you don't always agree. But at the end of the day, you love each other. You put all that stuff behind, and you got to do mm -hmm. that. And especially in, in African American family, how difficult it is for us. You know? Absolutely. Now, as you share that, I know you have a grandson that's, that's playing at Boston College. I know yep. you have another brother uh, whom we haven't mentioned yet that uh, works has his, his company working with NFL players, et cetera. Oh, yeah. And oh, Reggie, yes. Yeah, Reggie, yeah. yeah. Reggie, so Reggie, do, I, Reggie, do, Reggie all over. He's doing great, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Black, I, I, I have always been an activist, what people call activists. I just call it being yeah. a person that's concerned and, and that's yes. not going to take any foolishness. Yes, sir. And sadly, it, it bothers me when I see uh, people of color be reduced <clears throat> to, well, he just got lucky. Are they, and 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 your your brothers, your eight of you guys, 
right. and 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 you guys still, as the old people say, the Bible talk about you fought a good fight and all that. You know, when the when the the, the verse when they're burying people, you know, I finished my course. I, I can't think of that that uh, passage, but uh, when I talk and when my audience, that's what man, they they are going crazy with <laughs> these thumbs and hearts. When mm -hmm. we hear people like Willie Blackwell talk. The, the universal world does not seem to understand that everything you've said comes into play. Yeah, there'll be difficulty times, there'll be disagreements, you know, uh, sometimes even to the brunt of anger, et cetera, et cetera. However, yes. that does not give us a reason to go sit down and stop working yeah. to make a better life for ourselves. And and that's why I say, you know, because I, I, when I mentioned to you about having a lot of young people in, in my audience is that too many times I think, and I tell my wife this all the time as well, uh, Blackwell, I said, I think it's our generation that dropped the ball uh, with our young people is because we don't emphasize that enough. We don't, we don't, we don't work on them knowing who they really are. You know, we love to say, well, well you, you know, stop, please, 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 speak. No, it, it maybe you said that because I just had this conversation uh, with my grandson the other day, and and I was telling him because I I was asked to speak at the graduation for at the uh, Christian school here in the McDonough Community Christian School, and and, and they were and, and one of the guys was saying you know it had to, I knew you had to have some difficulty being an African American male uh, in the seventies in that corporate region because we you know we know how America is. How was you able to filtrate that? I said, well, you know, I said, I always be respectful. And so I know what I was dealing with. And so, uh, you know, decisions you make, it could be a blessing or a cursing. I said, I remember this lady, uh, as uh, uh, she was a secretary. And I was with Gay Gourmet. And I was in the, in, the, in the flight kitchen. And they were talking about maybe promoting me into a corporate. And this lady just called me the N-word. Okay, and she started hollering, and I said, "Okay, now I have, I have, I can make a decision to slap the hell out of this lady, and probably not get that promotion. I still got to take care of my three kids and my wife, or I can say, hey, ma'am, you know something? I don't really appreciate you calling me the N word. I said that's, you know, that that is very uh, 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 distasteful." Uh, I say I, I re always respected you and admired you for the work you've done with with, uh, with us, and I don't know why you would call me that. And, and I appreciate if you wouldn't do that again. And in doing that, <laughs> of course, another gentleman heard it, <laughs> and they got with, and they said, they said, man, how were you, how were you so poised to do that? I said because oh, that one decision could have stopped me from getting a sixty-two million dollar food service account that which took care of me and my wife if I'm able to be retired right now talking to Mel if I had a slap her. <laughs> now that's a powerful story. And again, the thumbs are going up in the hearts of that. See, that, that's a powerful story, uh, Elder Blackwell. And that's what our young people need to hear. Uh, point, point blank, allow me to say this to you and, and our audience and people that are listening. Until individuals understand that we must learn who we are, that is, and and this is just uh, what what I call the Larsism, is that I see what happens so many times with with the world at large, but even more specifically, uh, just as you've explained, with people that look like us, is that we still don't know who we. And, and I experience this too much as an educator and working with young people yeah. as I do. We I don't know, know you who do. We, are. we let everyone else describe to us who we are. When I when I hear kids look like me talk about, I'm just keeping it real. I'm just keeping it 100. Who said so? Who said so? Who said destruction was keeping it real? Who said keeping it 100 was keeping it real? Who said not educating yourself was keeping it real? Who told you that? How does mm -hmm. he, you bought into a negative narrative. So when our young people hear the Willie Blackwells of the world, who not only transitioned through life, became a success, embraced God the Father Almighty, weathered the storm, having kidney cancer, continued to weather the storm, 
you gave such a, 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 a face to what you were doing, people stepped forward and said, hey, and you've already said it to us, I got to help this guy. Then you unselfishly kept moving forward and say, but you know what? Somebody helped me. I want to help these other guys. So the reason I wanted you to go there is because as we talked before the show, too many times mm -hmm. people just hear the tail end of something and they right. never hear the journey. That's right. And they just assume that right. everything was easy or 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 right. you didn't go through the things they went through. Uh, people love to say, but you don't understand. My and grandson lot, told me that, Jalen. Uh, I said, Jalen, you at Boston College. It costs a hundred and fifteen thousand dollars a year to go to Boston College. You paid zero last year. The year before it was 125. You paid zero. I gave you a couple thousand to fix a car. They gave you some NL money, it was ten thousand, and you're going to school. And you telling me it's cold up there? You telling me that I got injured? I said, you know, foot injury. I said, I've been to three NFL teams. I know what injury is about. I understand. But it's not going to stop. It, it, it didn't stop me. Absolutely. You, can't, you made a statement when you came to my house. Well, it looked like you're still in the NFL. No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> God was Absolutely. good. <laughs> Absolutely. So you, well, can, listen, you can get through this. <laughs> that's that's powerful. But listen, we're going <laughs> to close this segment out. Uh, uh, Black Will, man. As always, it's always a pleasure yeah. uh, talking with you and sharing with you. And as I said, my audience... <laughs> I uh, was going crazy sure. here with these thumbs and these hearts. And usually, man, usually sometimes they'll come on and they'll put questions in the chat box. But mm -hmm. uh, dare I say, without embarrassing anybody, when they don't put questions in the chat box, I know they're really listening. How do I know that? Because a lot of times, because they are, a lot of them are, are you know, teenagers in some college, they'll put the questions that you've already answered. So I, I'll be saying to myself, they're not listening. So when, when they don't give me questions in the chat box to ask you, I know that they were listening and hanging on to everything that you said. And for that, I'm time. grateful and we appreciate you. My brother, would you like to leave us with a parting word? Well, I just like, like I say, man, you know, you know life is, 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 is what you make it. You know, a lot of things in life are not going to always go your way. They didn't go, always go my way. But I tell you what I did every single night. I got on my knees, and even when I was afraid for my college friends to see me in college, I waited until they went to sleep. I got on my knees, and I said my prayers. And I said, God, please help me today. Help me get through this test. Please help me to get through this job. I said, help, help me to deal with these employees. Help me to deal with this owner. Help me to deal with this client. Please help me in this situation. Please help me get a new kidney. Please help me help, help John get a new kidney. Please help Mary get a new kidney. Whatever I do, I try to play it forward. I said, God, yeah, I said, God, out of, all, out of all the gazillion people on this earth, if you keep me alive and keep me healthy, I promise you, I do everything I can to pay it back. Oh, amen. Amen. What a powerful message. Well, listen, Elder Blackwell, it's been great having you here, and we certainly appreciate uh, Dr. Is this is this Dr. Barbie Houston? I, I probably need to put my glasses on because I don't I don't like to insult people by uh, okay. not calling them the correct name. And uh, Bambi, Dr. Bambi H. Brown, uh, we we certainly uh, enjoy having you here and happy that you are our guest. And uh, we we do want to say to our audience is that as you guys know, every Tuesday night at uh, six p.m. Central Time Standard Time, uh, we come to you with other guests. And and as you guys know, we have athletes and we have CEOs and uh, musicians, the whole nine. We do a variety of shows. So please come back and don't forget to go to the Nobody Asked Me Guys show and subscribe. Now, we're not one of those subscribers where you have to go and, and then something pop up and say pay four ninety nine dollars 99 No, just our subscriptions are free. So please go and subscribe to our channel and encourage your friends to subscribe to our channel. So Brother Blackwell, it's been great, sir. And as you know, we, we stay in touch and we'll be talking oh, yeah. again. Uh All say right. hello to the family for us. And I, sure I want will. you to have a want you to have a great night, brother. You too. God bless you here.
God bless you, brother.